Welcome to a virtual tour of the Sierra Sacramento Valley Medical Society Museum of Medical History. The Medical Society is the oldest medical society in continuous operation in California, dating back to 1868. The museum was created 18 years ago and has expanded over the past two years. Uh, we hope you enjoy your tour and there is contact information at the end. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us. Greetings, I'm Dr. Bob LaPerriere, the curator of the Museum of the Sierra Sacramento Valley Medical Society. And uh, at this point, we're going to introduce you to the iron lung. The iron lung was a unit that was used to provide breathing capabilities for people, particularly those affected with polio. Now, there's only probably about 12 of these in public display in the United States today but there were thousands and thousands in use in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s before the days of polio immunization. Uh, there's two varieties of polio. The type most people are familiar with is the one that causes paralysis of arms or legs, and you see kids in wheelchairs and with crutches, but the other version is bulbar polio that affected basically the base of the brain and prevented the ability to breathe by paralyzing the respiratory muscles, which are the diaphragm, which is right down at the bottom of the chest cavity above the abdomen, and also the muscles between the ribs. Obviously, the patients would die if they were not able to breathe, so they'd be put in an iron lung for a period of anywhere from a couple of weeks to their whole life. Some people spent over 50 years in an iron lung. Now, the way it worked, we'll turn it on so you can actually see it running. We have a model here, basically, that shows exactly how it works. The patient's head would be represented by the black knob here. The diaphragm here would be represented by this diaphragm. And the red balloon would be the lungs. So when the diaphragm pulled out, it would put air into the patient's lungs and it would push air out of the patient's lungs when it went in. And that's basically the same way that your own diaphragm and your body works. Of course, you have to appreciate that these were used before the days of uh, uh, availability of television, so the people in there would be pretty isolated. Uh, their hands would be within the iron lung, so they could not read books, they could not do anything like that. Their only contact with the outside world basically was looking at the mirror above their head here. If they needed care, bathing, the nurses would go ahead and use these airlocks, which would seal around the wrists so it would not interfere with the patient's breathing. And of course, for other purposes, they would use this port and they would insert a bedpan as needed. So we have to appreciate today with the ability of immunizations, we don't have to deal with iron lungs and we don't have to have people concerned about maybe spending 50 or 60 years of their life in one of these. So uh, it really shows the importance of maintaining immunizations in children. The case to the left shows a wide variety of artifacts that were used in the laboratory
to help diagnose diseases. Uh, the case to the right contains a variety of patent medicines that are sorted according to the organ system that they allegedly work on. A variety of tools were used for bleeding. The upper left shows a flame which would be used to cut into a vein such as in the fold of the arm and let the blood run out into a bowl. The spring lancet on the upper right is similar to a flame but with spring activated so it would automatically penetrate the skin and the vein. And the one at the bottom you might think of as a Swiss army flame it had different size blades for different ages of patients. It might have also been used as a veterinary fleam. The scarificator was a spring-operated instrument. It would make multiple incisions in the skin, in this case 12 incisions made by the round blades visible below. Another option for bleeding was use of leeches. One leech can remove one to two teaspoons of blood. They also inject an anesthetic so the person does not feel them and also an anticoagulant which helps the area to continue to bleed for a period after the leeches are uh, removed. Uh, leeches today are actually used by plastic surgeons but for a different purpose. They are used in a surgical site where blood is accumulating to remove the excess blood. As you enter the museum, you will see part of the book collection to the left. To the right, the first wooden item is a diathermy unit, which is used to produce deep heat. However, the past history of the, uh, the use of this was not only to relieve discomfort by producing heat in a muscle, but actually it was claimed that it could treat a variety of illnesses, including some cancers. The radionics unit next to it is a quackery unit that was developed and used by chiropractors in the early 1900s.
The case to the left contains a lot of items related to x-ray or radiology, including the original x-ray tube used in Sacramento in 1897. The case to the right is that of Chinese medicine and has a wide variety of artifacts, including the green boxes at the bottom that were used for the storage of herbs in a Chinese herbal shop. The glass tube to the left is typical of the x-ray tubes used from the initiation of x-ray in 1895 through the 1900s. The handheld fluoroscope could be used instead of an x-ray plate so you could immediately view the results of the x-ray. This photograph shows Dr. Fay in his office and the generator that produced electricity to run his x-ray tube can be seen on the right side of the photograph. Comparing books in the library can be very instructive. This demonstrates the progression of the number of medical words from 12,000 in 1892 to 30,000 in 1904. Uh, the increase in medical words subsequent to that dropped off dramatically, suggesting the development of so much in the field of medicine in the early 1900 turn of the century era. Prior to the practical use of photography, uh, artists' sketches were extremely important in teaching medicine. This image is from the inside of a book, but the following two slides show images from anatomy books from approximately 1850. Images by artists were found not only in anatomy books, uh, especially in the 1800s, uh, but could be found in other books such as this image from a pediatric textbook. This photo shows a large part of our book collection. We have approximately 1,000 medical textbooks from the mid-1800s uh, to the early mid-1900s. In addition to that, we have approximately 500 books that are more research resource-oriented regarding medical history. This photograph shows an upholstered table that was used for examination and probably surgery uh, in the era of the Civil War. To the right of it is a microwave diathermy unit, uh, probably the first one ever developed. To the right in the background is our collection of bedpans, from metal to beautiful porcelain and ceramic ones. And in the foreground is one of several wooden wheelchairs from approximately the mid-1900s. The item to the left in the floor is a spirometer. This is used for measuring the vital capacity or volume of air in the lungs. The next case, the medication case, contains uh, things from medications that were prescribed by physicians, including things such as arsenic, strychnine, and mercury, and also some patent medicines. And the case to the right contains our extensive microscope collection. This impressive collection from Eli Lilly uh, contains leaves and plant parts that were used over the last 150 years as medications. Uh, one of these would be belladonna, another would be uh, digitalis, neither of which is commonly used today because of improved uh, synthetic medications. In the early 1900s and the 1800s, uh, medications were not generally available like they are today directly from the pharmaceutical company, uh, so the pharmacist actually had to compound and make the medication, including making pills, and for this purpose, he would use a spill roller. This is an example of the medication kits that a physician might carry with him in a house call in the 1800s and very early 1900s. 
a pharmacist uh, were often not available, and this way he could start the patient on the medication at the time of making the house call. These are two examples of commercial preparations, probably from the early 1900s. The one to the left is a combination of digitalis, strychnine, and nitroglycerin that would have been used for heart problems. And the one to the right would have been used for a sleeping medication or a relaxant, and that contained cannabis, morphine, and chloral hydrate. This case of microscopes also contains pathology slides dating back to the 1880s. One of these slides was examined and was still in perfect condition, and the framed item in the left upper top of the case uh, is the slide which showed trichinosis. The case to the left contains a variety of items that highlight the evolution of first aid kits. The examination table in the corner has a mannequin on it which is used to demonstrate the automatic electronic defibrillator. The black case to the right is a case containing a wide variety of scales and the case to the right of that uh, shows a number of tools of the pharmacist from the 1800s and early 1900s. This is the central area of the old part of the museum, and to the right you can see the Scopey case. That case contains a variety of instruments going back about 100 years, uh, which were used to examine organs by inserting them through a normal orifice or opening in the body or through a very small incision. This view shows a variety of exhibit cases, including the diagnostic case to the left, which includes stethoscopes, blood pressure gauges, and a variety of other items. The case to the right is a case detailing the history of obstetrics and gynecology, and the case to the right, ophthalmology. In the diagnostic case, one can see a wide variety of very unusual stethoscopes. The oldest one, actually a replica of the oldest one, uh, the wooden one at the bottom, uh, is a, an example of the one developed by Dr. Lenek in 1816. Dr. Lenek was a flute player and carved his own wooden flutes, and therefore was very adept at carving a wooden stethoscope like this. The one on the upper right side is a Littmann stethoscope, uh, one of the more common ones used for many, many decades. And the one on the right bottom is one that was actually produced by a 3D printer. The diagnostic case also contains a variety of sphygmomanometers, better known as blood pressure gauges. This one is from about 1910 and uses a couple of tubes of mercury to determine the blood pressure. The item to the left is a pleximeter, rarely known by physicians today. In the days before x-rays particularly, uh, to examine the chest and try to determine whether there was a consolidation or some kind of a hollow, uh, one would put a finger in the chest and tap it with another finger and listen to the sound. The pleximeter would be used instead of tapping a finger, you'd tap, tap the pleximeter and with a measuring eye area on it, you can actually determine the size of the area you were concerned about. The case to the right is a quackery case. Quackery is a promotion of fraudulent medical practices, drugs, or devices. Probably the most common quackery item, and I say this because we have more of this item in our archive than any other quackery item, uh, was a violet ray unit. The glass tube would be plugged into the handle and plugged into the wall, and the gas in the glass tube 
would then produce a violet color and it would be applied over the affected area and claims were made that it would uh, remedy or cure a lot of disorders and diseases which of course it did not benefit at all. This artifact is the Davis and Kidder electric machine for nervous diseases. It would be used by the patient inserting his fingers in the metal tubes which you will see in the right side and someone would turn the crank uh, which would produce an electrical current and again allegedly uh, cure a variety of disorders. The new wing of the museum actually was the remainder of what was the original library. It was the largest medical society library in California before its closure about 20 years ago. It had been temporarily used for offices and uh, they were closed and thanks to the generous donation of Millie Kahane, a retired nurse, we were able to expand the museum into this additional area. The wooden machine you see in the middle is an electrocardiograph machine from the 1950s. The black case to the right contains pacemakers and a multitude of prosthetic heart valves. Uh, many of these heart valves were created by Dr. Smeloff, a cardiac surgeon in Sacramento who, working with the Sutter Research Institute and the bioengineering department at Sac State, developed an extremely effective ball and cage valve. The slide shows two varieties of heart valves. The one to the right is a ball and cage type, uh, such as a type that Dr. Smeloff developed in the 1950s. This photograph shows a wide spectrum and varieties of heart valves in our collection. This corner of the new wing shows the wall which will have a variety of changing displays. The current one that was up for 2019 and 2020 was one in railroad hospitals and doctors in Sacramento. The machine you see to the left with the dials is a Bennett ventilator and as you look to the right you will see an anesthesia machine you all see see a bird ventilator labeled as a respirator here uh, the white and glass case has a wide variety of anesthesia items going back to the early 1800s this ether mask is very typical of the ones used in the 1800s you can see that it could be collapsed flat, so it could be carried in the doctor's pocket if needed. Uh, gauze or a fabric was put over the mask, and then ether was dropped, drop by drop, in the, until the patient fell asleep. Prior to modern anesthetics, uh, which are administered using a machine similar to the one you see here, ether and chloroform were used for anesthesia. Ether was the safest for the patient, uh, but it had to be used very cautiously because it was extremely flammable. Chloroform, however, was non-flammable, but it did create some cardiac or heart complications in patients. To the left, you will see the case that features a large number of artifacts related to infectious disease. The two cases to the right are related to surgery. The one to the right, particularly uh, Civil War and 1800 surgery. Penicillin was initially discovered by Fleming in 1928. However, he did not have the technology to progress beyond that point. In 1938, Flory 
found Fleming's original article and pursued it and with the appropriate technology at that time was able to develop penicillin as it is used today. Uh, it was first tried in 1940 but used uh, primarily from about 1942 on. It was used particularly in World War II uh, and the production of it initially was very limited. This miserable looking kid had a severe case of measles and in that case a sign such as the one shown would be posted outside the house or home where he lived. Fortunately today because of immunizations we do not generally have measles, which can not only be miserable, but it occasionally can be fatal. This impressive looking machine is a pneumothorax machine. The purpose of it is to inject air into the chest cavity, collapsing a lung. Before the days of chemotherapy for tuberculosis, treatment was very limited and not very specific and collapsing the lung to let it rest for a long period of time was one of the accepted treatments. Smallpox is one infectious disease that has been totally eradicated through the entire world and that has been done by vaccination using smallpox vaccine. It does not contain the actual smallpox virus but contains a vaccinia virus which does not produce the severe problems that smallpox does. And it's related to the cowpox virus which is a virus that Jenner used in 1796 uh, to initiate vaccination for smallpox. This is a typical Civil War era field surgical amputation kit. The most common operation done at that time was amputation. Uh, if an injury had a broken bone that penetrated through the skin, the mortality rate was about 100 percent because of infection. The amputation mortality rate was about 50 percent. In this kit you can see a trifine which is a little round saw used to bore a hole in the skull uh, to release blood pressure that was pressing in the brain from an injury. Also you see the amputation saw and in the back not too visible are amputation knives. Unbelievably complete records were kept of patients during the Civil War and in the later 1800s six volumes, giant volumes, were printed. Three of medical condition, three of surgery conditions. This image from one of those shows the kind of injury that was caused by the bullets of that time and also one that would definitely at that time have required amputation. This is a kit that was used for blood transfusions. It actually would be used to transfuse one person directly from another person. This is our dental corner. The tall unit to the left was used for most dental work. Uh, it had the standard handles that would power the drill and it's from approximately 1910. Uh, the chair to the right of that is a typical dental chair and the drill to the left of it is a foot operated drill. Also notice the two pictures on the wall. This is one of the images that is in the wall in the dental area. It was an engraving done by Bonavera in the 1600s. Bonavera re-engraved the images that initially had been done by Vesalius, but he flipped them 180 degrees uh, 
probably to make sure that people were not accusing him of just copying the image without actually re-engraving it. The nurse room exemplifies the changes in uniforms from the 1800s to current. Also, it contains a lot of information showing the spectrum of nursing and how it's changed in that period of time. The mannequin to the left in the wheelchair is Mrs. Chase. She was the earliest simulation mannequin that nurses could practice on. Here we see Mrs. Chase again. She was actually made uh, by the wife of a physician who asked her, uh, as she had made dolls in the past, to create a life-size doll for nurses so they would not have to practice on straw-filled mannequins anymore. The last room in our tour is a recreation of an approximate 1920s doctor's office complete with a beautiful oak examination table, a beautiful wooden cabinet, a sterilizer, and an EKG machine. Uh, also a bookshelf containing a number of beautiful bound books. This unique EKG or electrocardiograph machine is from about 1920. It is unique in that it does the tracing on photographic paper, whereas more modern EKG machines use a heated stylus. This exhibit showcases the history of railroad medicine in Sacramento. Sacramento had three railroad hospitals in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and a number of physicians who worked specifically for the railroad. In fact, the railroad hospital in Sacramento was the first hospital in the West that started using Lister's theory to prevent infections. Thanks for your attention and taking our virtual tour of the Sierra Sacramento Valley Medical Society Museum of Medical History. Uh, we will welcome you to do an actual tour once we open after the pandemic. Contact information for the museum is in the next slide.